Okay, well, hello, everybody. I'm Lisa Reichert. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the Career and Professional Development Lead within People and Organization Development, which is part of People and Culture. And I want to welcome you all to this Now Encore Series workshop, which is Become a Certified Campus Sustainability Advisor. I think we can all appreciate that sustainability at work and in life is important for so many reasons, which span ecological, economic, and social dimensions. And here to help us understand why sustainability is so important at UC Berkeley and how we can contribute to our campus sustainability goals and consider taking our sustainability efforts deeper by maybe taking those steps to become a certified campus sustainability advisor um, are our co-presenters from the Office of Sustainability. Um, they are all student fellows, and I want to welcome Brittany Wu, Samir Amin, and Alina Halstenberg. And I want to share a little bit about um, each of our co-presenters. Brittany is a fourth year environmental science and geospatial information science student here at Cal. And Brittany has been an Office of Sustainability Student Fellow since her freshman year. And she has since worked on numerous projects like the Campus Sustainability Walking Tour, the UC Berkeley Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Reading System, known as STARS, uh, the 2024 submission, and now the Sustainability Staff Training, which we are doing here today. And in her free time, Brittany enjoys making art, cooking for her roommates and discovering new restaurants in the Bay Area. We'll have to chat about those restaurant recommendations, Brittany. And I also wanna welcome Samir. Samir is a third year environmental justice and sustainability student here at Cal. Samir is supporting the Berkeley Office of Sustainability as a Climate Action and Resilience Fellow and a Bonnie Rice Fellow through the UC Office of the President. Samir is working to make the Berkeley campus more environmentally resilient to hazards through the development of an updated vulnerability assessment. Samir is also a student voting member of the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Sustainability. Outside of the Office of Sustainability projects, Samir helps to manage student groups and campus culture through his position as a peer leadership consultant. An avid hiker, traveler, and foodie, Samir is usually exploring the Bay Area or cooking food on the weekends. And Alina is a second year environmental economics and policy student at the University of California. She is working at a, as a Climate Action and Resilience Fellow of the Office of Sustainability and a Bonnie Rice Fellow with UC Office of the President. Alina is working on updating the Hazard Vulnerability Assessment Tool in order to create a more environmentally resilient campus. And she also works in the ASUC Office of the President in the Environmental Justice and Sustainability Department. Outside of her environmental related interests, Alina enjoys traveling, dancing, playing the piano and spending time outside with her friends. Well, thank you all for your commitment and all the work you're doing on sustainability. And Brittany, Samir, and Alina, I will let you take it from here. Great, so we'll just get started. Welcome to our workshop discussing the UC Berkeley Sustainability Staff Training. And we're very happy to have you all here and being so willing to learn more about sustainability at Cal. So here's a quick agenda of what we'll be discussing today. We'll start with discussing the UC Berkeley Sustainability Staff Training. What is it? And then going into a little bit about um, the modules that make up the training. We'll be highlighting a special few that we think would be um, great to discuss with you all. Um, and then we'll go into what the benefits are to completing this training and a quick overview of the Office of Sustainability website, which has a lot of resources about sustainability on campus. 
Uh, and the format for this uh, training event, we'll go into each of the modules and then we'll have a little bit of time to answer any questions you might have. So this staff training, um, the UC Berkeley Sustainable Staff Training, um, this it was created by the Office of Sustainability to provide an overview of sustainability efforts here at Cal. This training covers 10 modules total. Um, and this covers a wide range of topics in sustainability, ranging from carbon neutrality to zero waste to transportation. And upon completion of the training, you can receive a staff sustainability training certificate. And we encourage that the staff enroll through the UC Learning Center. Um, that's linked on the slides right there. And this will be sent out um, after the presentation. Um, the training is online and self-paced, so you can spread it over a period of time if it's more attainable for you in that way. Um, and yeah, we hope that it will encourage discussion and reflection about sustainability here on campus. Um, this training contains a lot of information about news, um, current sustainability projects, and what you can do to integrate sustainability into your own workplace and um, here at Cal. All right, so we're going to move on to carbon neutrality and climate action, which is the UCOP standards that have been set. So next slide. All right, so the University of California, which controls 10 campuses, is taking action to combat the climate crisis and implementing practical measures to foster a more fair and more resilient, healthier world for everyone. The global climate disruption is causing unprecedented impacts on the planet, like many of you know. Elevated temperatures are leading to shifts in weather patterns, resulting in more severe storms, increased rainfall in some regions while others are increasing, uh, experiencing severe droughts, like here in California. Glaciers are melting at an accelerated pace and sea levels are rising, which are affecting many of the UC assets, not only at Berkeley, but the other nine campuses as well. So in 2013, the UC initiated the Carbon Neutrality Initiative, a groundbreaking commitment to achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions for its buildings and vehicle fleet by 2025. And the UC has been taking pretty bold strides to attain said carbon neutrality by 2025 and expedite the journey towards decarbonization. The university continues to expand its endeavors to enhance energy efficiency and increase the utilization of renewable energy sources, which we will get into later. The Global Climate Leadership Council serves as the advisory board to the UC president and chief financial officer to help achieve the goals the UC has set out. It also offers guidance in advancing UC's endeavors, sustainability goals, teaching, research, and public service related to climate change and sustainability. This council comprises of scientists, administrators, students, and experts both within and outside the UC system, actively engaging the entire university community to identify the most effective practices, policies, and technologies for realizing carbon neutrality and advancing teaching and research in the realms of climate change and sustainability. So to support uh, the Global Climate Leadership Council and the rest of the UC Office of the President, there's a program called the UC Bonnie Rice Climate Action Fellowship Program, which Alina and I both partake in, which allocates funds to student-driven projects that align with UC climate action endeavors. All talent campuses, along with the UC Office of the President, UC Agriculture and Natural Resources, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory all participate in this program. And now I'm going to go quickly over some of the aspects on campus that embody the Carbon Neutrality Initiative. So the first and foremost is energy, and I'm going to get a little bit more into this later on when we talk about the Clean Energy Campus Project, which some of you may be familiar with, but it's really important that Berkeley strives to reduce its carbon footprint in the realms of energy. And Berkeley is currently proudly leading the way for the UC system in terms of what is possible for energy production, storage, green hydrogen, fuel cells, as well as battery storage for our new uh, geothermal heat pump that we'll get a little bit more into later. Next slide. And so really 
Berkeley kind of starts with this ground up approach. Um, at first and foremost, we are an institution that focuses on research, but a lot of that research is actualized in our classrooms. And so our Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management is the third best environmental slash ecology education in the world, uh, sorry, in the US and sixth best in the world. And not only is this, you know, part of the faculty being you know, truly some of the best, but our students also take initiative to teaching environmental studies uh, through a program called DECAL, which stands for the Democratization of Cal. It's a program that we have here that was founded through our student government that allows students to teach their own classes. And so just in the fall alone, we have nine environmental studies courses that students from uh, both the undergraduate and graduate schools can take. In addition to that, we have 55 different SPUR projects, which are initiated by faculty in the College of Natural Resources that are helping to make our campus more sustainable and also our surrounding communities more sustainable. And really, it's this concept of it takes a village to make sustainable uh, and, and radical change. And, you know, a lot of this learning that takes place in the classroom is then actualized through action. And so you have the ASUC, which is the Associated Students of the University of California, uh, an independent 501c3 nonprofit in nature that acts as our student government. And within the ASUC, you have the Office of the President, the Eco Office, and STEAM, which are all different uh, sustainability slash environmentally conscious divisions of the ASUC that actualize projects both on campus for staff, faculty, and students, and as well as off campus. Berkeley is the only UC uh, within the UC system with a funded student environmental resource center that also helps to support a lot of this change. And then we have over 40 environmentally related organizations on campus, all contributing to make the campus more sustainable for faculty, staff, as well as students. And really it's, the, again, this idea of translating the knowledge learned in the classroom to actionable change. So a little bit about what uh, Berkeley is doing in terms of its sustainability plan and performance. Berkeley receives a platinum uh, rating on the STARS assessment. So for those of you who don't know, STARS stands for Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating System. And it's a program funded through OSHI. And there's only 12 universities out of the 190 that are assessed with a platinum distinction. Uh, Brittany, as well as the rest of the Office of Sustainability, is currently working to pursue a renewal in this rating since uh, our our license kind of expires in 2024, but we are pretty sure that with the standards that we've been able to achieve, we'll be able to receive that platinum rating again. So there are a few uh, carbon reduction plans that have essentially allowed for us to make this radical shift downwards. This comes out through our 2025 carbon neutrality planning a framework that has obviously sprung off from the UCOP carbon initiative. Berkeley has produced three of these climate action plans and emissions are significantly lower than they were 30 years ago. Berkeley has met its first carbon reduction target and we plan to continue that through implementations of the clean energy project, which um, if we go to the next slide, talk a little bit more about. So the clean energy campus, a project that took a lot of both student effort, staff effort, and faculty effort to get approved was finally approved this past summer. The UC Regents, which are the governing body for the UC system, voted unanimously in favor of Berkeley making this radical change to its energy system. And essentially what will happen is we're planning on developing a fully electrified campus for heating, cooling, and that we will see an 85% carbon reduction by 2030, once this project is fully actualized. The goal is to achieve zero carbon, uh, zero carbon building energy use and manage the campus as a fully electrified uh, microgrid. And so, like many of you know, UC Berkeley does have 45,000 students, but we also have an additional 20,000 faculty, staff, and professors that come onto the campus frequently, which makes UC Berkeley the size of a small large, uh, a small city, which means that we need to have our own microgrid in order to support our different functions, whether that be research, classrooms, or just the day-to-day -day actions that take place on campus. This thermal heat pump, which is um, the thermal electrification system, will replace the 
cogeneration plant with a central heat pump plant supplying hot and chilled water for heating and cooling. This makes us largely resilient and independent from the rest of the grid. Berkeley currently purchases about 7% of its electricity from PG&E, but this will allow us to be completely independent from the rest of the grid in the event of a wildfire, earthquake, or power outage. So a big question is, why now? Why are we making this change now? Well, the co current co-generation plant on campus, which is powered by natural gas, uh, burns roughly 150 pounds of CO2 every minute. Um, and that, that kind of conversion uh, from natural gas to coal is extremely damaging in terms of, you know, how our energy is supplied to the rest of the, of the campus. And so our, our current cogeneration plant, our natural gas plant is reaching its end of life within the next five to 10 years or so. And a significant investment would be needed to make sure that it could continue to function. So instead, uh, both Berkeley and the regents feel that it is the best uh, approach to instead fully replace the system with something that aligns more with federal and state carbon reduction and energy standards. And this will uh, this new system will be completely repl replicable on the other nine campuses. And so it's kind of setting a precedent for what clean energy can look like through the rest of the UC. This system is also scalable. So as Berkeley continues to take more students or continues to expand its operations, it can be scaled upwards to increase energy efficiency, something that the cogeneration plant is currently not uh, capable of doing. So if we, uh, yeah, Alina, take it away. Um, now we'll go into a brief activity where you can each search up your department's building or a building you spend a lot of time in and then calculate its energy usage via the link. Um, you can paste your answers in the chat and let us know if any of, any of the numbers surprise you. I just put a link to the um, site where you can check out your building use. It's in the chat. Yeah, it does sometimes take a while to load. Um, all the buildings um, that are affiliated with campus are included um, on the on the screen. Alina, I'm curious, like, what tool is being used to monitor all these buildings and come up with these ratings? Um, I'm not actually too sure about what tool specifically is used, but um, there is a, a system in place which manages to track all the um, energy use for every building um, and is currently up to date so then they change um, every hour even um, and so it's interesting to find the peak times um, for, for each building and it definitely varies and some of them are very surprising. Yeah. 
Yeah, it looks like um, Abby mentioned um, my office is off campus in the Golden Bear Building UC Extension, not on the list. Is there a plan to include it? Also, Banway Building, 2111 Bancroft is not on the list. So is it just like campus facilities or campus-owned buildings that are monitored? I think it's campus-owned buildings mm -hmm. right now. So, but there should be, currently, the, I don't think there is a plan to include it, but um, we can definitely work on including those after as well. Um, Shelly mentioned could not find 2610 Channing Way. And are you tracking the dining units? Yeah, so the dining units are fully um, tracked on there thanks to the Housing Dining Sustainability Associates, which is called HADSA. And they do assessments of how much energy is being used within the individual dining halls as well as the residential halls. And sometimes there are challenges between the different dining halls and residential halls to see which one can use the least amount of energy. Okay, so while while people start um, uploading them into the chat, maybe we can uh, move on to the next slide. Um, great. Um, so when we're working from home, oh. Uh, when working from home, your health and well-being should be a top priority. So taking regular breaks to stretch and looking away from your screen can really help reduce overall stress and make you feel better. Um, in order to reduce waste and save money, um, you should print less and use services such as Google Drive and Dropbox to digitalize your files. Similarly, when creating your home office, you should find items around your house that you can use. Um, so the reuse store in MLK has a secondhand um, office supply um, area that you can definitely get your hands on. Um, Public Surplus, which is um, linked in the deck, um, is a website that helps keep an inventory of items open for auction to the UC Berkeley community, so you can purchase equipment from there. Uh, lighting accounts for almost 20% of your home electricity usage, so it's really important to make sustainable lighting choices so that you can save energy and money, such as implementing LEDs or even using natural light when you can. It's also really important to reduce your vampire energy, which refers to items that are turned off but still plugged into the wall, as up to 20% of your power bill can come from these items. You can also find your local composting policies and locations with the hyperlink um, in the deck as well. Um, and finally, PG&E offers rebates on qualified energy efficient products, as well as home improvements that are easy to apply for after installation. So this is another great way to save energy, water and money. Next slide, please. All right, so if people aren't familiar with the concept of a carbon footprint, essentially it allows you to track how much each activity that you do from a day to day contributes to your overall CO2 emissions. And so your carbon footprint is a good indicator of, you know, you know each of the individual activities from your day to day, how much is that contributing to the overall global warming that we're experiencing? And that whether that be travel, your home energy use, the different foods that you eat, shopping, and a, a great tool uh, called uh, made by the Cold Climate Network, which is used by a lot of UC Berkeley professors as well, kind of helps you actualize what your carbon footprint is. I know that we sent this out a little bit before our training. So if you did end up taking the footprint beforehand, um, if anyone wants to share out what they thought was a little bit alarming or what they thought was kind of uh, interesting, you're welcome to do so now. Otherwise, please go ahead and, you know, t take a look at this tool afterwards to kind of assess, like, what areas of your life do you think that, you know, you're handling really well? And what areas do you think you could be more sustainable, whether that be through the work that you're doing through UC Berkeley or even at home? But, yeah, if anyone wants to share, we can kind of take a minute to just talk about it. And if not, I, I think I had a, some some insights from it as well.
I'll I'll just share that um, in taking a I think like the energy efficiency in my home needs to be improved. I'm using gas appliances and um, this old house being very poorly insulated. Yeah, Lisa, that's a it's a great point that you made. A lot of homes still have like gas stoves and convection ovens and those kind of contribute a lot to both your energy use, but also just the health within a home. Uh, my apartment here at Berkeley uh, uses a conventional uh, gas stove, but my home in Los Angeles has an electrified stove, which is six significantly better just for energy use, but also uh, contributing to the air quality within your home. So I think what's interesting about this carbon footprint tool is if you kind of operate in different areas, whether that be your office building, your home, or if you have a home away from home, it's interesting to track kind of the emissions from each day-to-day -day thing. I think the thing that will significantly move your footprint the most is how many times you consume meat during the day. So that food scale really goes drastically up and down depending on are, are you eating beef in your diet? Are you eating chicken in your diet? Are you eating pork in your diet? As many people know, beef is the highest polluting meat. Whereas if you were to eat chicken, that scale would really uh, fluctuate quite a bit. And if you were vegetarian or vegan, that scale would kind of shift down all the way. It's a really interesting thing to look at if you were curious about, you know, how you're contributing to climate change. But uh, if there are no uh, questions or insights, we can we can move. Great. So um, do we have any questions for the previous module or are we all okay to move on? I think we're good. Great. Okay. Um, so we'll be moving into the next module about zero waste. So Next, I'll be talking a little bit about the UC policies and plans surrounding zero waste. Um, you might have heard of the Zero Waste by 2020 goal. Um, this was created in 2004 as a part of the UC sustainability practices policy. And seeing that now it's 2023, it's now been renamed Zero Waste 2020 and beyond. So this plan was initially a UC target um, formed to maximize this diversion of waste that goes into landfills by the campuses. Um, seeing that our campuses are um, comprised of a lot of students, faculty, and staff, we have a large amount of waste. Um, and this plan is not to shift UC Berkeley completely from single-use items and the need for waste bins. Um, but there is, it's more a call that no waste should be wrongfully sorted. So Berkeley for focus first and foremost on reducing, and that's followed by reusing, recycling, and composting. And this is an effort to pivot from um, this traditional linear, linear style of waste more to a circular economy. Um, another plan is the UC Berkeley single use plastic reduction target. This was signed a couple years ago in March 2020, and this focuses more on eliminating single use plastics by 2030. Um, the UC Berkeley Sustainability Plan was also updated in 2020, and this document outlines all the sustainability-related goals and strategies for campus, um, and specifically talking about their um, waste portion. Um, they want to achieve zero waste by prioritizing reducing, reusing, and then recycling and composting by reducing 25% of waste per capita, from 2015 and 2016 levels by 2025, reducing 50% per capita by 2030, and diverting 90% of municipal solid waste from the landfill. So these goals are uh, represented in all the policies and plans of the campus currently. 
So Brittany, I, I just have a question. So did we achieve the zero waste goal by 2020? Was that achieved or we kind of reframed it and expanded it? Um, we expanded it to um, be more overarching um, and speeding up these targets as we know that um, it's even more important for us to work on these on reaching these targets quicker. Um, so they've sort of been reframed in this mindset. Yes. Okay, thanks. I see we have another question. Is the campus working with the city of Berkeley on reducing single use plastic? Um, I believe that a lot of the policies and plans um, are beneficial with the city. Um, this is all in the same um, mindset and overarching goal to meet these reductions in plastic reduction. Um, and um, going into the sustainable practices policy that also is working even more on reducing these zero waste plastics with the city. And yeah, so the sustainable practices policy, it's also linked here. Um, this outlines all the sustainability goals for the UC campuses. Um, there is a section F of the document focuses on zero waste. So even more, if you're interested in that, um, we recommend that you check it out in the slides that are being released following. Um, and this also corresponds to the UC annual sustainability report. Um, this is... Uh, and a report on the school sustainability programs, sort of a check-in on um, how we're addressing these goals that we're trying to meet. Um, and it also includes information on the, the campus's waste diversion and progress overall. Um, and yeah, uh, there are sections on green building, uh, waste, transportation, fiscal spending. Um, so that report is also linked as well. And it provides the most recent updates on, on uh, the zero waste progression here at Cal. Um, and then uh, the graphic on the right is just um, a continuation from the following slide for zero waste from um, by 2020 and beyond. Um, these are just tips on diverting waste from landfills and which belongs in which bin, if that has been confusing in the past. Great, so um, the following is more about organizations for zero waste. Um, I won't be talking about all the organizations since there are uh, many on campus. So here are a couple. Um, Cal Zero Waste manages over 25 tons of solid waste that move through the campus daily. They are the facility surface, services staff that is committed to expanding recycling and composting programs while also providing effective refuse collection services. Um, the Zero Waste Co Coalition, um, that's their image on the right, um, they are a coalition of over a dozen zero waste related organizations on campus. Um, they are funded by the Green Initiative Fund and the Zero Waste Fellows uh, from the Office of Sustainability actually lead the coalition. Um, and they have two main events of the year. They have Zero Waste October, which just occurred. This is programming and events to celebrate and raise awareness for zero waste every October. And uh, there is Cal Move Out slash Cooperative Reuse that occurs in May. And this is an annual furniture recycling program that um, recycles furniture within the community. It's free furniture for community members. And their goal is to reduce waste during move out. And their meetings are open to whoever wants to attend. So I recommend if you're really interested in zero waste, they have a meeting every three weeks at 5 p.m. in the, on Wednesday in the CERC space. And their next meeting is actually tomorrow. So um, if you're interested, we recommend you check it out. Um, and lastly, there is the zero waste at Cal Master Doc linked at this on the slide. Um, if you have any 
more questions or interests in zero waste, they have information about the history of zero waste, um, what projects on the campus is currently working towards zero waste, as well as resources to check out. Brittany, we had one question in the chat, I think it's referring to a couple of slides back. When when is the annual report updated for that zero waste 2020 and beyond? Do you know when it's updated? Um, right. Um, so Alina and Samir can correct me if I'm wrong. It was updated very recently, but um, I'm not exactly sure which date it was. Sorry, one second. But yes, I can go back a couple slides. Yes, the current one that's out is 2022, but it will be releasing the 2023 um, very soon. Right, yeah, and this is what it looks like. It's a very, um, this is the overview doc. Um, and then if you want to check out the individual resources, there are all of the links right here. And that link is in the slides as well. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Great, and um, a couple more organizations. As Samir mentioned earlier, there was the Housing and Dining Sustainability Advocates or HADSA, and they are a program in the Residential and Student Services Program, and they provide sustainability services to dining halls and cafes operated by Cal Dining, um, as in addition to campus-owned residential halls and athletics concessions on Cal Catering. Um, and they also provide training and education of proper waste sorting to the staff members in the dining and housing spaces. So super essential to our zero waste uh, 2020 and beyond goals. Um, and there is also the Haas Green Team and Chu Ha Zero Waste Team. Um, they are a collection of staff and students, undergraduate and graduate working towards sustainability in the Haas Business School. And they were essential to um, Chu Hall getting its um, true platinum certified zero waste building certification. So a great achievement of the UC Berkeley campus. So now we're going to get a little bit into resiliency and environmental justice, both of which are important in understanding when implementing sustainability into your different roles on campus. So a brief interview, uh, overview of what environmental justice is, I'm gonna present two different uh, definitions. So the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency is a government body dedicated to combating environmental, social and health issues. It defines environmental justice as the fair treatment, meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental regulations and policies. So a little bit of background, the EPA was founded in 1970 per the push of President Nixon and is not predicated on the values and beliefs of people of color, unfortunately. So we will take a look at another uh, definition to draw a little bit more of a comparison. So on the right there, you have a picture from the first ever National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit, which took place on October 24th of 1991. It's considered to be one of the most significant events in the history of the environmental justice movement. And it took place at the United Church of Christ's Commission for Racial Justice, which hosted the four-day summit in Washington, D.C., the members of the summit made sure that the term environment was no longer associated with isolated wilderness regions, which was largely the, the, the perspective in the 70s and the 60s, and instead a pure natural setting, as was uh, frequently the case for environmental organizations that were predominantly white, seeing it as an isolated wilderness region. So it was important to them that people understood that the environment was a place where people lived, worked, studied, 
played and prayed, essentially an extension of the human experience. And as a result, it covered a wide range of topics, including toxic contamination, workplace safety, housing and transportation. And so on the next slide, I've gone ahead and highlighted five of the 17 principles that they outlined in their definition of environmental justice. If you were curious and you wanted to read all 17, and all you have to do is type in the 17 principles of environmental justice. To this day, these 17 principles uh, still withhold, and they are considered to be the definition of environmental justice by the people that are genuinely uh, disproportionately affected by environmental justice injustices in the United States. And so what we're going to do on this slide is I'm going to give everyone just about a minute or two to read the five principles that we've gone ahead and highlighted. And if just one very brave individual could share out uh, something that resonated with them, that would be great. You're also welcome to just type it out in the chat too, um, but I'll give another 20 or 30 seconds or so. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with number five. That's also one that sticks out to me. I think um, a lot of people look at, you know, these issues as being larger than life. But really, if we all kind of did our part, which is the whole point of being here, um, we could definitely make some change. So, um, Shelly, that's a great question. These 17 principles just kind of essentially outline what environmental justice is. And they apply to every scope of life. So whether that be individuals, your workplace, your place of worship, your place of consumerism, your place of education, it applies to, to anywhere that you exist because the world around you is your given environment. So it's essentially anywhere. Um, so if you're at your home, that's your individuality, but uh, at your business, that's also where environmental justice should be exercised. All right, thank you all for, you know, participating and giving me your insights as well. Does anyone have any questions about, you know, usually environmental justice is covered in an entire semester's worth of curriculum or in a longer one hour presentation, but does anyone have questions? This is generally about what it means to, um, to exercise justice within the environment, specifically what environmental justice means or how that could apply to your workplace. Samir, I'll just mention that I did put a link to all 17 of the environmental justice principles in the chat, and I will do that again, and we'll send that out as well. All right, then we'll go ahead and move on. Great, so I'll now go into a bit about resiliency um, at UC Berkeley. So um, Berkeley is already being impacted by the effects of climate change. And within the Berkeley area, the key climate impacts expected are wildfire, drought, extreme heat, sea level rise, water loss, and in increased storm intensity. So in 2022, the Office of Sustainability sponsored the Chancellor's Advisory Committee on Sustainability Climate Change Resilience Working Group in an effort to take action and ensure safety and security for Berkeley's most vulnerable populations. 
This group is working on updating UC Berkeley's existing climate vulnerability assessment, which was developed in 2017, and is currently identifying new ways that campus departments can collaborate towards an equitable, safer and more resilient campus. A few other deliverables include identifying and exploring the feasibility of mitigation strategies that uphold the values of diversity, equity, inclusion and justice, as well as including climate change resilience strategies in an upcoming update to the Climate Action Plan, which is expected in 2026. Um, and I'll open it up to everyone else. If um, people could maybe yeah, feel free to share or type in the chat how you've seen climate hazards affecting your work in your workplace. Absolutely. Power outages is one that I'm actually going to go into a little bit later on. Um, but that's, yeah, definitely um, a big one. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, air quality as well. Um, and yeah, we've also been researching that recently and higher temperatures too, um, both of which I'll also go into a little bit later on. Um, great, thank you for sharing. Next slide, please. All right, so we're gonna get a little bit into the different practices that Berkeley ensures to make sure our campus is resilient. And a lot of these apply to the workspace. So our Berkeley Office of Emergency Management ensures that there's clear communications when power outages are gonna happen if it's a planned power outage and communication about where to go. Um, where there might still be power so that you can continue to work. There's also the campus air quality map. Uh, I understand if you look at the top right there, it covers three main parts of campus. I know some of your workplaces may not be covered, but this is updated every hour by the Office of Environmental Health and Safety. There's also warn me updates that are sent directly to your Berkeley emails and can be set up to go to sell your devices as well. So if you're ever curious um, if you look at any given warn me email it'll give you the steps to follow to apply that to your phone as well because i know we're not always on our emails and then what's important to note from that last bullet there uh, ncaa standards uh, are kind of used by obviously athletes because that's the athletic commission but i think these are important guidelines to follow also for staff also for faculty um, if it's 150 aqi which you can either figure out that on the campus air quality map through the Office of Environmental Health and Safety, or just AQI now, which will give it to you based on zip code. If it's 150 AQI, you should consider limiting your outdoor activity. If the AQI is over 200, you should definitely not be outside. Uh, close your windows so that the pollutants can't get into your home or your work environment. I think it's generally just important to make sure that you are monitoring AQI when there are wildfires nearby, especially if you have um, you know, compromised immune system. I personally have asthma, so I feel extremely uncomfortable between that 150 plus range, but everyone is different. Can warm me updates also be uh, tied to your staff location? So I'm assuming you're asking if they can only, you can only get updates for where you are instead of getting it for the entire campus. Is that your question? Well, yes, or related or both Got it. for campus and for where you actually are. So you know what's going in along around in the Berkeley community, but if you're, you know, in Richmond or San Leandro, those kind of, you know, look where you physically are located as well. Yeah, that's a great question. Unfortunately, I believe Warn Me is kind of limited to the main campus. I don't think I've ever seen a warn. I've seen a few Warn Me's for RSF, the Richmond Fuel Station, but I haven't seen warn me is like kind of on, on out campus uh campus buildings i think for those you're best using like a third party app but unfortunately to the best of my knowledge i could be completely wrong i don't think that you can set up warn me's specifically to a staff location but that is a really good question all right i'll move on um, so during drought and extreme heat events, there's an AC alert system in place that 
also can warn residents and provide resources and information surrounding cooling shelters. However, this system isn't actually used as often as necessary. Um, UC Berkeley also has a heat illness prevention plan that's reviewed annually, which outlines how staff that work outside should work closely with their teams to do more strenuous work in the morning when the heat isn't as bad, as well as monitor each other for signs of heat exhaustion. Um, and you can see that graphic there um, outlining if you're experiencing the system uh, symptoms, what you should do. Um, the Office of Environment, Health and Safety also has a short online heat illness course that you can take if you're interested in learning more about policies in place. Um, additionally, UC Berkeley also recently hired a tree crew to get rid of the trees that were susceptible to falling that were near pathways and also completed an updated campus-wide tree inventory. Next slide, please. Um, UC Berkeley is doing very well to conserve water on campus and in July 2023, earlier this year, a resilient water plan was produced, which outlined the projections for the planning year 2036 to 37. Berkeley's achieved its goal to reduce growth adjusted potable water consumption by 36% by 2025 and we're actually now at 37% compared to the three year average baseline of 2006 to 2008. Additionally, the law building Eshelman Hall and Chu Hall, uh, which is Lee Platinum certified, um, employ stormwater capture for either irrigation or in-building reuse. And over 90% of irrigation systems are automated and connected to a weather station. So it's no surprise that Berkeley achieved 97% of available points in the Ashi Stars report in the water category. Next slide, please. Storms and sea level rise. So we talked a little bit about why the carbon neutrality initiative from UCOP started in the first place. One of the main points being that the warming climate is contributing to stronger storms and the melting of ice caps, both contributing to sea level rise as well as flooding. And so there are some of the buildings on campus that have kind of evolved to accommodate these changes and, and be more resilient. So both the Kaohsiung and the new Bechtel Engineering Center We'll have, uh, Lee Kaohsiung already does have a green roof, which is filled with vegetation to both attract pollinators, but also reduce the water that's getting run off the building and increasing the water quality through soil filtration. Additionally, we talked about how currently our energy from our campus comes from the cogeneration plant. While we do purchase 7% of our electricity through PG&E, the rest is generated through that cogeneration plant, which makes us largely independent from the grid uh, making us more energy resilient to storms, fires, and other natural disasters. But once that new clean energy campus project is implemented with that thermal heat pump, we should have full resiliency through our own microgrid. And then there's also plans through the UC Berkeley Master Plan, which is a plan that kind of outlines some big ideas the campus is thinking about in terms of implementing within the next couple of years, which kind of outlines these four new green infrastructure typologies what does that really mean? If you go to the next slide, um, on this map, you can see there are a bunch of areas on campus where they're planning to implement green infrastructure typologies, which are essentially different uh, agricultural landscapes that can either benefit um, the people inhabiting the campus, so that means staff, students, and faculty, or can improve biodiversity and overall the environmental health of the area. Um, what's really important to note here is we're planning on implementing areas where water can flood more easily and, and can go downwards and into green spaces rather than covering up pathways and making a hazardous zone for anyone who's walking by. So now I will briefly talk about two areas that were identified as gaps in the vulnerability assessment tool. And this first one focuses on the eucalyptus grove on campus behind the Valley Life Sciences building, uh, also near Mulford Hall. And eucalyptus trees are a non-native species that have flammable oils in their barks. So if they catch on fire, they'll actually spark new fires elsewhere. Um, therefore, the campus master plan has recommended a tree succession plan to implement native coastal redwood trees to replace these eucalyptus trees. There are currently 550 eucalyptus trees uh, in six groves on UC Berkeley and Berkeley Lab property, which is known as the line of fire. Um, since new fires could spark and then spread, this could potentially ignite homes and exacerbate the housing crisis. Next slide, please. 
Um, the other area that was identified as a gap in the vulnerability assessment tool was the evacuation protocol during power outage events, which others also brought up. Um, so preemptive public safety power shutoffs often occur during wildfire events. And currently, the campus master plan outlines two current strategies that enable campus operations during a power outage, which are passive survivability and backup power. However, when these power outages do occur, the elevators stop working in buildings. So people with physical disabilities will struggle to evacuate these buildings. Um, there are a few evacuation chairs in buildings on campus. However, these aren't enough. So people with disabilities are encouraged to fill out a self-identification questionnaire annually so that they can receive the necessary help during these events. Next slide, please. All right. So we talked a little bit about environmental justice. We talked a little bit about resiliency. Now it's really important that, you know, within your own individual workspace, you kind of an analyze how much um, of the DEIJ principles are in place. And so I'm sure we've all heard DEIJ and have a decent understanding of what those values mean. But um, we've gone ahead and sent out this spreadsheet, this template that you can fill out within your for your own individual organizations, really to understand and grade yourself on how many of these principles are being exercised within your own institutions. So just briefly, what are we talking about? Um, we're talking about DEIJ in terms of sustainability, in terms of diversity, it means including a broad range of voices in the planning process to create, integrate comprehensive range of experiences, barriers, needs, and strengths enabling a creation of robust solutions that solve intersectional issues. So for equity, we're focusing on prioritizing and allocating significant resources to vulnerable communities that have experienced injustice and in disproportionate harm in ways that eliminate barriers to meeting their needs. And in terms of inclusion, then this means adopting practices and policies and programs that create the conditions of belonging and mutual respect for historically excluded groups or individuals to join in participatory decision making. And lastly, justice, the practice of both acknowledging and redressing the roots causes of historic and present day disparities through collaborative efforts that avoid causing additional harm, repair previous harms, and heal communities. And so it's really important to note that DEIJ uh, directly coincides with environmental justice. And so by doing this report, you can better analyze you know, the areas that your organization could still use some work and the areas that you guys have already uh, greatly excelled in. So I would definitely encourage everyone to take a look at the spreadsheet after the, the training to, you know, assess your own individual organization. Sure. Um... Brittany, do you want to answer Jessica's question? Because you have the tool handy on you. Uh, yes, let me open the spreadsheet. Great. So um, I know that it says like programs and main programs. You can also just um, have an overview of your personal organization instead of program. Um, so basically in a way to fill this out. You can do this on your own or um, as a group with your um, with your team and your workspace. Um, it's a great discussion tool. So this is sort of like a preliminary, you can grade what you do well and opportunities to improve within each of the DEIJ categories. Um, as we've been saying, um, just, being able to see what you're doing well and where you can improve is a great start to improving DEIJ at the workplace. Um, and we have the space for all of them. And then you can calculate your overall DEIJ score. Um, I believe it's out of 20 um, since each one is scoring at one to five. And then from there, you can also, if you have individual programs that you want to evaluate, you can also do those as well, um, besides your organization on the on the full scale.
Okay. Um, Great, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah. Um, if there's any other questions for the the past module, um, if not, we can move into transportation. Okay. Uh, and we'll, we're going to start with a quick poll. So um, this poll is of two questions. The first question being, how many times do you take public transportation in a week? And how often do you drive alone in a week? So we'll take a minute or two. Hopefully everyone is able to respond. Okay, and we are at 100 participation. Okay, so um, yeah, looking at the results, is everyone able to see the results? Great, okay. So we can see that though we don't have the highest percentage of people who take public transportation, we do really well in not driving alone when we are um, driving to work. I know some people in the in the introductions, they said that they bike to work, which is amazing. Um, yeah, and then we'll go into, oh, yeah, share results. Okay. So yeah, every vehicle on the road releases an average of one pound of carbon dioxide per mile driven. So even if you're not able to take public transportation as it may not be as accessible for you, um, being able to prevent driving alone, it'll, it'll reduce your carbon emissions by 45% and decrease pollutants in the atmosphere and improving air quality overall. So UC Berkeley commuters are fairly great at commuting in a green way. 83% um, walk, bicycle, ride, share, or take public transit. Um, and 35% of the UC Berkeley campus fleet is now green. Um, UC Berkeley had a goal of reducing employee drive alone rate to 36% by 2025. And I'm happy to say that we've already achieved it. So we're already heading in the right direction. Um, here are a couple of transportation resources um, that you may or may not have heard of. Bicycal is a bike repair co-op, which is located in Lower Sproul, that offers peer-to-peer -peer bike repairs and education. Um, they, their goal is to teach individuals how to maintain their own bikes for longevity. Um, and we also have We also have staff and faculty Bay Wheel memberships. Um, so Bay Wheels um, is offered to two different staff groups. If you're not part of the 2850 Telegraph employees, you should be able to qualify for a partially subsidized membership anyway. And undergraduate and graduate students also qualify for a $13 a month style program and EOP students can access this program for much cheaper. So if you're a staff member that works very closely with students, we recommend that you encourage them to check out this opportunity as well. Um, next we have a program that was created by the Office of Sustainability. It's called the UC Berkeley Business Air Travel Carbon Mitigation Program. And this program uh, wants to mitigate these high environmental impacts of our business air travel by investing in campus programs that reduce the, the entire campus carbon footprint. So in the carbon footprint calculator earlier that Samir shared, um, you might notice that if you travel a lot um, using, using planes, it might bump up your carbon emissions by quite a lot. So this program aims to reduce that footprint. Um, so the way that this program works is that it assigns a small fee to UC Berkeley business air travel trips taken. Um, and it's a fee per domestic trip and offshore slash international trip. 
Um, and this program invests that uh, that fees collected into innovative and necessary campus projects that save the campus um, money and reduce its carbon footprint. And this program also aims to help UC Berkeley reduce the need for or find more sustainable alternatives to air travel, such as making, um, making some meetings virtual and more accessible to work from home from. So some examples of the projects that this program aims to fund is retrofitting lab equipment to reduce energy com consumption, supporting on-site solar PV and battery storage installations, promoting alternatives to traveling for meetings, and installing EV charging capabilities and incentivizing electrification of the campus fleet. So um, this program is also up on our website and there's a whole FAQ and more information about it if you're interested. Great, now for the engagement module, I'll provide a brief overview of some of the resources related to sustainability that you can look into further if you're interested. Next slide, please. So the Student Environmental Resource Centre operates as a centralised organisation for the environmental community here at Berkeley, and it's a great way to find out about other environmental organisations. So if you work with students, uh, this is a great place to refer them to, and it's located in the MLK Student Union Basement B North. Um, other staff also work here in various positions, such as the Sustainability Initiatives and Operations Manager, for example. Next slide, please. The Green Initiative Fund provides funding for projects that support sustainability on UC Berkeley's campus and is specifically geared towards improving environmental justice efforts. Students and staff are able to apply for grants each semester by submitting a proposal that's then considered by the TJAF committee. So if you have a project in mind, you could maybe think about submitting a proposal for the next spring semester cycle. Next slide, please. Um, the Sustainability Walking Tour is another great way to learn more about sustainability on campus. Um, the tour takes you along a route where you can encounter Berkeley sustainability projects and find other additional resources. So I would definitely encourage you to participate in it if you haven't already. Thanks, I think. Um, next, the Ecology Center is a nonprofit organization in Berkeley whose mission is to inspire and build a sustainable, healthy, and just future. It aims to address critical issues through a model of education, demonstration, replication, and advocacy. So it has many different resources to offer, such as farmers markets or educational workshops. Thanks, I think. Finally, the Citizens Climate Lobby is another nonprofit grassroots climate change organization that is focused on national policies to address the global climate crisis. They train and support volunteers in building relationships with elected officials, the media and the local community. So if any of these organizations interested you, I would definitely encourage you to take a look at their websites when the side deck gets sent around. Sorry, so the Berkeley Climate Change Network is another great way to get involved. And if you're interested in learning more about different uh, ways, different news um, uh, related to sustainability or have access to other resources, I would encourage you to subscribe to um, Bruce Ryden's network and you can email him at that link over there. Great. So lastly, before we end the training, we did want to emphasize the benefits of completing our sustainability staff training, um, such as being able to integrate sustainability into your day to day and career. It's also a great team building opportunity. There's room for lots of unique discussion and uh, working towards a common goal is is a great way to bring your team together. Um, we also may reduce costs by following these more sustainable practices, as well as demonstrating your commitment and ethical practices to ethical practices and social responsibility. Um, and if we have time, I think we have a couple minutes. So I would love to show you the Office of Sustainability website um, over here. Okay.
So it's a great resource if you want to learn more about sustainability at UC Berkeley. On our website, we have a news section which shows um, the news items of the more recent projects that have been going on. Um, if you want to check out all the projects we've been working on, it's all here, what we've been discussing today, um, as well as the Business Air Travel Carbon Mitigation Program. And uh, we also have an engage section if you want to get involved in these different um, things that we have going on, such as a zero waste coalition, the resources right here. Um, Alina mentioned the sustainability walking tour, which is here as well, um, and the staff training. Um, we have a tab for carbon solutions if you want to learn more about getting to zero carbon. Um, we have a clean energy section. Our performance section has all the information on what our campus is doing in terms of all these different topics. And lastly, we have a plans and reports section. If you wanna learn more about sustainability planning and reports, they're all here. Um, it's a big resource. So we encourage everyone to check it out. Great. And if you have any questions about the training or sustainability in general, you can email our um, sustainability at berkeley.edu. And thank you everyone for attending and discussing sustainability with us today. Thank you so much, Brittany, Samir, and Alina for being here, for sharing your knowledge and your time and your passion about sustainability and all that is happening here at UC Berkeley and UC and what we can do here and beyond. Really appreciate you. And I also want to mention that Brittany, Samir, and Alina filled in. We had um, a staff person scheduled to present today, and um, that person moved on to another role. And so thank you for stepping in and sharing. And it's really just exciting to hear all that you are doing as student fellows here on campus. And um, thank you all for attending and for your interest in sustainability efforts, what's being done, and how we can all contribute. So I put a link to the evaluation in the chat, and I will follow up within the next 24 hours in between my meetings um, to share in an email all of these resources and the evaluation link. And I will also stop recording.